Thank you, Richie. Uh, uh, I know our main purpose here today is to learn and to prepare for a 2013 crop. But as I said out here, it, it struck me that this many should have a tone of celebration too. As, as we take a moment, I think it'd be appropriate to take a moment and look back on last year and the things that were accomplished and just a phenomenal crop that we had. Uh, a lot of factors went into that. Uh, Obviously, the most important factor was weather and uh, just ideal conditions, and I think we know where to give the praise and the honor for that. Another factor that sometimes we take for granted that I believe was a big factor last year is a result of years and years of research. We take that for granted, I think, but if you look back, um, for instance, uh, the progress we made in pigweed control, to me, strikes me uh, as, as a, a, a real progress made through research uh, that, that, that we fund as growers. Uh, fertilizer efficiencies, uh, harvest efficiencies, irrigation efficiencies, uh, all those come from, from years and years of research uh, that's vital to us. Um, obviously, one of the greatest ones is uh, variety development. It also takes a long time, but, but we saw the results of years of research that really blew the roof off of yields and off of quality for this year. So uh, research is, is the thing that uh, has sustained us in the past, I think, and I think it'll lead us into the future too. So uh, I would encourage us as growers not to ever take for granted the, what goes on sometimes unseen. Uh, so as we talk about research, uh, <coughs> our next speaker is what I would consider a research guru in a lot of ways. Uh, Dr. Cater Haight comes to us from uh, Cary, North Carolina, the world headquarters of Cotton Incorporated, uh, where he serves as vice, vice president in charge of, ag, of the Ag Research Division. Uh, he has vast experience in the industry. His, uh, his late last work was in, with Monsanto at their uh, technical development area. Uh, Dr. Cater has numerous degrees. So I won't go into all that. I, I'll just say that he's well qualified to, to, uh, to lead the, the division that he leads, and we're just lucky to have him here with us today. So we just welcome him here and look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Lee. I'm lucky to be here. Um, as Lee said, y'all just hit an absolute home run last year. You know, two things came together. Uh, yields across the U.S., uh, phenomenal. Many states just at the absolute top, Georgia right there. But controlling uh, pigweed despite the expansion is just an incredible testament to what growers do. And let me get rid of Richie's presentation, and we'll try to find hate right down there at the bottom. Excellent. Good. So I'd like to start with that optimism that Lee left you with. We're gonna get a little pessimistic for a while, and then we'll try to end up on some optimism at the end. And so we'll talk a little bit about the textile market, not so much prices, demand, but a little bit of the hole that we've gotten ourselves in and what we're doing to get ourselves out of that hole. And here's the first chunk of that hole, is we all know that on a global basis, the demand for textiles closely tracks the economic growth of, of the world, and that's what these two lines show, that when things are good, as they were for a big chunk of time, about, about eight years there, going up, economy, the world economy goes up, and world demand for textiles goes up. Then we hit that 2008, and both come crashing down. But what's hidden on that slide that doesn't pop out at you if you look at the scales, on your right is world GDP, and you look at you know, a 1% change in world GDP, on the left, that scale is the percent consumption of, by consumers of textiles. And you can see that a 1% change in GDP is a 3% change in the world demand. So we've got a situation where uh, the consumer is extremely hypersensitive to the economic situation and you throw that on top of the, uh, the very uh, untimely um, break between the traditional prices of cotton and polyester, and our main competitor just clobbered us because of that price differential. Um, cotton spiked and polyester went up a little bit. So between the two of those, we've suffered uh, last three years, global decline in cotton share of fibers, and you can see we were very stable for about 15 years. We've lost three percentage points. It's gonna be a real struggle to get back up there. 
That previous stable point, there's about 15 years on the left of that graph, that was before the major production of, of polyester plants in, uh, in, in Asia. So polyester has been, been a, a key thorn in our sides and in, in taking market share away from us. Um, obviously focusing on the U.S., we've seen uh, cotton share has declined, maybe flatten, flattening, uh, maybe picking up a little bit. Barry, um, our CEO, Cotton Corporate CEO, who developed uh, these slides, he's optimistic and he feels that this last tick up at the end provides a little bit of optimism for farmers here in the U.S. So with that challenge, let's talk about what we're doing to address it. And Cotton Corporate has a very clear mission uh, to promote cotton, improve the profitability, and we, use that, use, we do that with just research and promotion. Those are the tools that we utilize, and we're incredibly fortunate that we have growers like Louie and Lee, who are our leaders. In fact, there's 110 growers who are on the board of Cotton Incorporated. And that's a massive number. Those of you that work with companies um, know that 10 is a large number, but 110 board members is huge. So they break themselves down into very effective units. And these are each of the grower units that, uh, that manage Cotton Incorporated. Each consists of about 24 to 26 growers. Lee has just come on to the ag research, and so we'll get his input in that area. But we have 24, 26 on each one of these areas. And the mandates or the charge that they've given to us are right here in terms of ag research. Obviously yields at the absolute top, managing pest, number two, Managing scarce resources, and this is primarily water, is, uh, is number three. Seed value, uh, what can we do to crank up cotton seed value coming out of the gin? <coughs> Grower education and tools uh, is, is a big issue. And sustainability transcends all of Cotton Incorporated. Sustainability uh, is a hot topic with the, with the consumer, and since cotton is purchased by consumers. It's not fed to hogs or, or pigs. Or um, What the consumer wants is what they get. The consumer is always right in this game. And right now, the sustainability issue is incredibly important to those consumers. And so you'll see it appearing all across these committees. But just I'll highlight some of the things that each of those committees has achieved this last year. And um, one of the first things I wanted to do, because it relates to the stability of yields that, that Lee has, has mentioned, we've had a huge growth in irrigation in both the Mid-South and the Southeast. And this has been a new form of irrigation because historically we thought of it as just a California and Arizona type, type tool. But the Mid-South and the Southeast have now supplementing rainfall with irrigation. And in fact, the official numbers, which are out of date, uh, for 2008, the Ag Survey had um, 250,000 acres of cotton irrigated in Georgia. And I understand talking with your extension people, it could be double that, it could be three times that right now, it could be half of your crop, it's a massive amount. And so obviously managing water when you have this awkwardness of rainfall coming in requires a different approach. What works in California and Arizona doesn't work in Georgia. So this uh, publication was put together. Um, it's available on our web. I'm going to highlight where you can get the information off the, off the web. That's our website. And just type in irrigation, and you'll bring this up as a very strong Georgia contribution and expertise. But it's valid for both the Mid-South and Southeast. Another component of the of water management in the humid areas is also driven by that untimely rain that occurs because even though you can do an excellent job of forecasting where hurricanes are gonna go, we still struggle with that day-to-day -day weather trying to forecast that. And if you drill down on a field, we struggle even more trying to figure out how much of that rainfall actually went into the ground. So in the rainfall area, irrigation, uh, the scientists feel strongly that some measure of soil moisture really helps to really dot that I and cross the T as to how much water is in the root zone, how much is the plant using, 
trying to understand whether we need to turn that pivot on or whether we can leave it off and save a little bit of money. So last couple years, extensive work looking at soil monitors. These are the couple things that, uh, the four that, that, that really shined. We've got other ones that are under evaluation. The technology for wireless communication is there with these, um, with these type of uh, soil moisture sensors. Another area that, that adds a cost efficiency to cotton, obviously, is precision application and knowing where, uh, what parts of your field are, are yielding at what level, uh, trying to identify these problems and, and match your inputs to it, uh, is an area that, that is reviving interest with yield monitors. And so with the help from, uh, from experts here in Georgia, just recently put out a, uh, a guide, again on our web, just, uh, just put in cotton yield maps on the search and you'll bring up two nice publications on how to use maps, some real site-specific grower examples, plus a good um, across-the-board presentation on that technology. One of the long-term areas that uh, Cotton Corporate has been involved in is helping you eradicate pests. In fact, the very first research to demonstrate how bull weevils could be eradicated, that was funded through Cotton Incorporated. Um, we had pilot studies in three locations to try to demonstrate the diapause uh, strategy combined with, the, with the, uh, the spring strategy, the square, the square applications. And we continue to play a big role in, in providing technical support and funding uh, the eradication not only of the bull weevil, you know, we're down to just a little bit of Texas and the border into Mexico, but the pink bollworm, which is less important for you guys, getting that out of Arizona and California and Texas and that one's just about gone very successful. So there's a role still that we play in, in that area. Uh, Lee mentioned the glyphosate resistant weeds through the Georgia Cotton Commission. Huge amount of research um, by your scientists have made these fields clean this year. Expensive, no doubt, but clean compared to where they were in the past. And let me just also mention on that, this provides really timely uh, benefits from a marketing standpoint as well. We've just recently had an issue where the weed specialist in the northern belt states are telling uh, their farmers that don't use any of that manure coming from dairies if they're feeding cotton seed because it's chock full of, of pig weeds. Well, obviously that is very disturbing um, to, to cotton seed values and we jumped on that. And the fact that the fields were clean in 2012 gave us the strongest argument that this is a non-issue. These fields are clean of pigweed. Growers are predominantly not letting them go to seed in between what's taken out in gins. We have a good story to say instead of being behind the curve and being beat up by the weed scientists in the, uh, in the Midwest. Another critical area for Georgia in other sa states with sandy soils is nematodes. And again, if you go to our website and type in managing nematodes, you'll get this uh, summary bulletin. It's the first of many talking about how you manage nematodes. Again, as Lee mentioned, this has been a long-term research program, but it's been one that's cranked up into full speed into high gear as soon as we lost Temic. Um, when, when that became obvious it was gone, we just really had to crank it up. Grower education is one that is, is also we're elevating, and this is gonna be the flagship delivery program for a lot of the, the cotton expertise, the, uh, the, the plant management network, and, and Dr. Ryan Kurtz, who's here, is organizing this for us, but it's gonna be a repository of everything useful from a cotton production, cotton management, um, it's going to be made available free to every cotton grower in the U.S. and it's going to be launched in February. You'll get a lot of information about it, but it will be a, a good access point for a lot of the information to help you manage cotton better. But keeping it in the back, you don't have to know everything about cotton, but you want it available when you need that particular problem. As I mentioned, sustainability is a big issue, and we have the textile industry uh, trying to, to set standards and metrics, and we're very involved in those organizations. But really, the flagship one that, uh, that we're most proud of is one that both the National Cotton Council and Cotton Incorporated uh, play a big role in. It's cross-commodities, 
and it includes uh, major input suppliers, but also a lot of the GMO, a lot, excuse me, not GMO, of the um, NGOs. Uh, Doug, uh, uh, Freudian slip on the GMO and NGO there, sorry about that. Uh, that. So it includes a lot of the environmental organizations uh, with that. In, through the field, uh, field to market consortium, we've been able to demonstrate the dramatic gains that cotton has made over the last couple decades. If you look at the reductions there on, on your left on the, uh, the impact of cotton production on major metrics, particularly soil erosion and water, you can see that growers have done a tremendous job and graphically it's reported on the right with a smaller circle, which is every five years, getting less and less impact on these major metrics. So instead of doing battle with some of the critics of cotton by throwing mud back at them, we throw science back at them, throw solid numbers and, and throw rational discussion. And that's turned the corner in the respect that cotton has and cotton receives in the, uh, in the, the overall global textile community. Another area that we've been very active in is trying to create tools to improve cotton yield and cotton quality in a long term. And one of the uh, real significant breakthroughs came in December when we had one of the cotton genomes was published and Georgia played a key role on that, in fact, the key role. One of your scientists, Dr. A Dr. Andy Patterson, um, was the, the lead author on this cotton genome. And that is the tool that allows mm -hmm. cotton breeders to unravel the mysteries and the knowledge that's going on in corn and other crops and leverage that very efficiently to make cotton varieties higher yielding, more stress tolerant, and disease. So shortly after that was, um, it was made publicly available, we, had a, we sponsored a, a cotton uh, genetics workshop, first time it was held in the U.S with the breeders around the world and the public sector, private sector breeders and talk about how we improve cotton breeding tools using this new knowledge. I mentioned briefly about cottonseed and cottonseed is, um, is one of those areas that we've had a real success story with going into the dairies um, and to just keep moving the bar up on cottonseed. This year we launched a new web seat, a website called Cottonseed Marketplace and that is a, a transaction location where dairymen can say, I want to buy a certain amount of cottonseed, and 40 buyers are, are on it saying, I can provide it at this price. Well, the first year of that, that, that um, exchange, the electronic exchange, one third of the orders for cottonseed going to the dairy went through that exchange. So a huge success in the first year out of the, out of the rattle. I've talked a little bit about the, uh, the accomplishments. Let, let me briefly hit the three other committees of Cotton Incorporated. Um, the next one is research in, not in ag, but research in textiles and in innovations in, um, in the processing of cotton and new innovations. And I'll just hit a couple highlights on these. One of the things that's done every year is the creation of new innovative fabrics that consumers might want. And these are created at Cotton Incorporated uh, samples, along with explanation cards about how to create these, are sent um, and made available to textile mills around the world uh, so they can see some of the novel things that cotton can do. Um, these, these were actually the ones that were the biggest hits in 2012. So you'll see these in, in garments in 2013 because there's a little bit of a lag time from innovation to actually getting in the, in the, uh, in the shelves. One that I think is, is really, really cool is wrinkle resistance. You know, we've addressed that primarily with, with chemistry um, by holding the cotton, making it stiffer together, but we're now looking at using psychology to control wrinkles. And for instance, one of the, the ideas is that if you change the colors of cotton and the patterns of cotton, does it look wrinkled? Doesn't matter whether it is wrinkled or not. It's just a matter how it looks. And these are all wrinkled versus pressed garments. And you can see that some of these colors, like the yellow, the wrinkles disappear a little bit better. But you go to patterns, and you can see that the wrinkles almost completely disappear from the eye. 
So it's a way to give you a 100% um, natural, without processing, challenge, addressing one of Cotton's key challenging using a psychology or the way the eye is working. Um, chemistry and cotton is one of those areas that um, we struggle with because they, they keep telling us that, no, don't use that chemical or don't use this chemical. And chemicals keep disappearing from the acceptable list. And so it's a constant, um, uh, not so battle, but it's a constant research endeavor to try to get the chemistry in cotton as safe and as friendly to the consumer as possible. Put a lot of effort into it. Um, you have to measure everything. If you're going to make any progress, you got to measure it. And so we do that at Cotton Incorporated. Everything from fiber to the finished garments uh, are measured. And obviously, uh, we like to see improvement. This is the improvement over a 10 year period in, in strength. Um, across the board, we've had great improvements in cotton quality. Let me move uh, into the, the textile outreach. This is an area that, that a lot of you are not familiar with because the textile industry is now over in Asia. So this emphasis is, is largely, we go where the consumers are from the standpoint of the, of the brands and retailers, the textile industry. Denim is our number one concern and doing something innovative with denim is just absolutely critical. Uh, this is Levi's brand new product that incorporates a, the trans dry. These products sell at $115 to $160 a pair. So you can see why the, the brands and retailers love to um, incorporate innovation in, into, into cotton. Another program that's been incredibly successful is getting these fashionisti or brand and retail people, these textile people, and dragging them down to the farm and visiting with a grower. And that, that just opens their eyes in a incredible way, particularly if they get to drive a cotton picker. And last couple of years, last three years, um, the grower has let them drive a cotton, but at least sit in a cotton picker while it's moving. And it just absolutely opens their eyes. Um, uh, last couple of years, we've been to Larry McClendon's uh, operation, um, and they, they're just all smiles at, at the, after the end. Um, and a lot of the concerns about cotton uh, get deflected by that one-on-one. -on -one. They realize that growers are responsible stewards of the environment, and they, they take that seriously. We also work closely with them. I had the opportunity in October to meet with all three of these, and just to show you how scary, uh, at their headquarters in Europe, how scary the situation is. Puma, a company that started making just shoes, and shoes back then were made with just leather. Guess what product they think they're going to completely drop from their manufacturing? Leather. Because of some metric about how you measure sustainability. That could be cotton. So the communication with these uh, brands and retailers, particularly those that are real leaders from the standpoint of, um, of uh, they lead the rest of the industry, uh, that's critical that we have that communication. Um, we're constantly under threat. Here's a, a recent Greenpeace article on denim uh, in Mexico and uh, National Cotton Council and Kevin Latner brought this to our attention on World Wildlife Fund. One of the ways we try to counter that, as I said, is with facts and education and we, have, we launched the Cotton University this year to, um, to, to, to educate uh, these brands and retailers a little bit more about the things going on in cotton. So let me just finish up with the last, um, the last section, which is the consumer marketing. Uh, this is where we usually get to show pictures of, of, um, of pretty girls uh, that, that go out on, on TV. But one of the, the neatest thing that Cotton Incorporated has done over the last two years is this 24-hour uh, runway. When I heard that, it didn't make any sense to me at all. Why would you have pretty girls walking up and down a stage for 24 hours? They gotta look pretty ragged by the end of that 24 hour period. But the whole idea was to show the utility of cotton every single hour of the day. And, um, and it's gonna be, it was done in 2011, it's being repeated in 2013, coming up soon. But what they're doing really different this year is they're generating a lot, of, a lot of good press and a lot of PR building up to it. So they have brought in these fashion consultants uh, from around the US that are talking about it and getting the excitement going. 
um, talking about how developing the show is, is going to come along. Um, and we're using our, our fashion um, models that do the advertisements for us. We're using them as part of our, that buzz. And we're also um, using print media, both here in the U.S. and around the world, to really focus to get a lot of bang for the buck out of these big events that Cotton Incorporated sponsors. So just some one last metric. Um, this is the, the, how uh, respected the, uh, the advertising and promotion program is by our key target. That top line right there is women age 13 to, to 34, the target market. And you can see that their recognition of Cotton Incorporated ads is at an all time uh, for high for the last, last five years. We're actually for even longer than that. Um, really had a lot of bang for the buck in, in that regards. So let me just um, leave you with the, these are the three uh, uh, pieces of, of information that I think you should go and look at and download on our web. Uh, go to cottonincorporated.com and just put in either irrigation, cotton yield maps, or managing nematodes, and you get those three uh, hot off the press documents I mentioned. Uh, thank you, Jay, I appreciate the introduction and I'll hand it back to, to Richie or Carrot.